Good afternoon, everyone. We're pleased that you've joined us as we continue our series of virtual town halls hosted by Digital Promises League of Innovative Schools. Today, the topic of our webinar is the art of social justice. 2020 has amplified the inequities that exist in the United States and the effects of these inequities in our society create long lasting ripple effects for districts and schools. Students, many of whom are seeing the ills of our country for the first time, are eager to connect their learning experiences in school to what is happening in our country. Today, we will explore how the arts can provide a critical and necessary form of expression and learning by providing a medium for exploring history, interrogating the definition of justice, and conveying personal narratives. I am Kimberly Smith, Executive Director of the League of Innovative Schools, and I'm gonna ask my panelists to turn on their cameras. Here, one by one, hello, hello. All righty, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our panelists here. We're joined today by Nancy Lyons, the correct coordinator of Murals DC within the DC Department of Public Works. Jeremy Del Rio, Executive Director of Thrive Collective in New York. And from the League of Innovative Schools, Richland School District 2 in South Carolina, Ronnie Henderson Day, a filmmaker and educator at Westwood High School, and Aja Charles, a Richland 2 graduate and full-time artist. For the format of this session, we will begin with a set of questions and transition to audience QA for the last 20 minutes. Audience, we invite you to type your questions into the QA and panelists, I'm gonna ask you to be succinct so our audience can learn about your work and have a chance to ask questions. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna first go to the folks from the League of Innovative Schools, School District, Richland 2. Uh-oh, we appear to have lost. Is Ronnie, Ronnie's uh, must have fell off. All right, we're gonna go ahead and uh, jump to uh, Jeremy first. Why don't we get started with you talking a brief overview of your organization and the work that you do. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jeremy Del Rio with Thrive Collective. We create hope and opportunity through arts and mentoring in and around public schools. Uh, everything we do is project-based learning. So students work collaboratively in teams as well as with their teaching artists to produce something beautiful and transformational. Um, it's exciting to see the shared vision come to life from concept to completion. And, uh, and really to hear what they're saying in very creative ways about the world they want to create together. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Nancy, let's hear about your work with Murals DC. Hi, I'm Nancy Lyons, and I'm a public affairs specialist with the Department of Public Works in Washington, DC. And I also coordinate um, our program, Murals DC, which is sort of a companion piece to our abatement, our graffiti abatement program. I've been doing that for, um, I want to say 11 years. It, uh, it was piloted in 2007 and we have uh, completed uh, 133 original works around Washington, DC. And, um, you know, I'm just glad to be a part of a discussion um, while we're in the midst of social change and making history, um, just in the, uh, looking forward to uh, this discussion about how how young people uh, and particularly the arts play a key role in uh, social um, self social movements great thanks nancy uh ronnie are you out there i am the here um i'm uh we have a storm here so uh, my wi-fi cut out forgive me um i'm unable to start my video i uh, to do so it's oh is it showing you a message Yes, it is. Um, so while you guys address okay. that, I will introduce myself. Um, yes. My name is uh, Ronnie Nicole Henderson Day, and I am um, first and foremost an educator. Um, it was my first dream career. Um, my second dream career was and is a filmmaker. Um, and I have found a way to fuse those into um, there I am, um, into kind of um, my life's purpose. Um, in particular, we deal with social justice issues um, because I believe that if we are addressing the whole child, we have to kind of help them um, to grapple with 
what they're dealing with um, when they watch the news and scroll on their social media feeds. So um, that's who I am and that's what I do. In my personal work, I deal a lot with healing generational trauma. Um, and those things are so tied up in um, social, our, our social, everything we go through in society. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ronnie. And Aisha, welcome. Hello. Well, my name is Aisha Charles. A lot of people know me by Aisha Monet. I am a self-taught artist here in Columbia, South Carolina. And as far as my work is concerned, since I was a child, art used to be self-therapy for me. So when it became a business, it was more of just taking basically just putting lights in dark rooms, showing people that there's always an alternative way of dealing with life. So when things started really popping off as far as just speaking out against injustices in America, I just started to use my talent as a way of being a visual voice to those that can't just say exactly how they feel. My art gives a feeling and that's just what I've been doing lately on public art scenes as far as murals and on canvas. Excellent. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, so we couldn't start this webinar without showing some art. Uh, so we're going to ask uh, Dwayne to put up some pieces and have each of you, you brought an image. Um, I'd love you to share um, how the role that art has played and impacted um, 2020 in terms of racial and social justice. Uh, from the perspective of the organization you are affiliated with. So Nancy, this is the image you brought. You want to share a little bit about this? Right. So those are um, five images of one of the projects we did this summer. Um, C coordinated two projects this summer. The first project was the um, Black Lives Matter mural on um, 16th Street um, leading up to the White House. And um, the second project a week later was um, doing this, uh, what we call murals, hashtag murals DC 51. And uh, this is basically all about um, Washington DC's, um, our, our, um, our, our wish to, to achieve statehood and the task that we were, that we asked artists to complete was basically to paint murals that would help to not only promote um, the issue of statehood in Washington, D.C. And, and, and help it become the 51st state, but also um, other social messages that um, are important to people, social justice, um, racial, um, uh, you know, racial discrimination, um, sex discrimination, um, you know, and, and things that bridge the, the gap toward racial harmony um, and, and, and issues like that. So it was sort of a, we, we did, we did 40, uh, let's see, we did 41 original uh, works, and then we did um, what you're seeing in the middle is actually a photograph um, that was um, one of the artists. Each artist had uh, a number of projects that they were to do, and this particular um, photographer in the middle had already been doing a, a series of um, works that basically sort of kind of um, embodied just um, just statehood and, and uh, similar themes. So we included him in, in our project, but mostly it was mur original murals. So, um, you know, the upper, upper left, you've got the, the sister with the Afro and it says, protect our black women. Um, below that, you have um, an uh, image of a, of a, of a guy. The, um, his mask says, you are loved. And, and I'm not sure, if you live in DC, you've seen a lot of those taggings around on the sidewalk. A lot of uh, DC street art is um, are like stickers, and so those were like stickers or or like stencils that it, that you'll see around DC where it just says "You are loved," and then you've got the um, the persona in the in the mural um, with the universal um, sign for "I love you," and he's got the shirt on that says um, "Douglas Commonwealth, a uh, 51st state," and Douglas Commonwealth was a name that was proposed as a potential name for Washington DC if it, if it achieved statehood. And then, you know, the, the murals were, they were, you know, they were serious, they were funny. You've got the upper right-hand corner, you, you know, you've got a little, a little pie, a little tasty looking cherry pie with a little slice in the symbol of the, um, of the DC map. 
and uh, and then of course you know the lower the lower right hand corner um, you've got 51 and that was um, Lisa Marie uh, Thalhammer is sort of known for her very colorful rainbow type mural so we we pulled together muralists who were very well known in the city um, just to just to come around these messages of statehood and social justice um, you know the entire summer was basically Murals EC isn't typically a program that focuses on um, messages of social justice, but um, usually we focus on history. But this year, certainly, we social justice was a big part of what we did. I mean, we kicked off the summer with the Black Lives Matter mural, which um, has had a huge impact. To this day, there are Black Lives Matter murals um, in 70 cities, around the country in 25 states around the country um, and including three countries. So you've got these murals that this particular mural kicked off that spans over three continents. So to say that that um, had an impact, a global impact um, is an understatement. And certainly when we did it, we had no idea that it was going to have this sort of um, this sort of impact. But, you know, art has always um, always unified youth in the midst of social unrest. I mean, in all of its many forms, young artists and young artists have always sort of led that art revolution. You know, rather, whether you're talking about singer, singers from uh, Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, um, powerful social message albums, um, you know, like, uh, Mar like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, or poets like Nikki Giovanni. Um, you know, the earliest, even when you look at dance form, the earliest socially segregated um, interaction was dance. So, you know, it, art has always played a, a huge role in terms of leading the way and helping toward helping young people express things that they may not have necessarily been able to express um, verbally. Young people have a lot of emotions and a lot to say, but can't always find those words to say. You know, people turn to, a young person might not know Picasso, but they know Banksy. And Banksy's messages are all about what's going on around the world. And so I feel like now um, more than ever, I mean, street art is speaking to young people in a way that it in a way that it hasn't before, and it's a great time to to use that to sort of start a, a, a discussion. You know, you can take them to a mural and say, you know, what is what does this say to you? And it gives them an opportunity. It gives an, you an opening an opening to have a conversation that maybe they couldn't they couldn't uh, they wouldn't have felt comfortable having before, and it helps to give them um, symbols that they can connect to to help them express how they're feeling and how they would like to see uh, the world. Great, thank you for that. And I love the broad brush going from global um, to DC and let's go to New York and uh, Jeremy, maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing at the Thrive Collective and the mural, I mean, the uh, visual that you brought. Uh, sure, so this is one of 12 uh, public art projects we facilitated this summer. Um, it's kind of a mashup of two and two campaigns, uh, the Kindness Beats the Virus campaign, which students designed in the week before the quarantine began back in March, responding to COVID, which you see uh, on the right being developed. And then on the left, um, a more of a social justice campaign called For One and All, uh, which originated in central Harlem um, at a, a group called the Living Redemption Youth Opportunity Hub. Um, but here in this location, it's at a cultural institution in the Lower East Side, which is where Thrive Collective was born. Um, the thing that about these projects that's so inspiring for me is watching uh, students find voice to the emotions and things that Nancy was just describing, right? That she spoke so eloquently about. Kids really do have a lot to say. Um, and it's, a, it's an innovative, um, you know, future-oriented kind of messaging. And when given the platform to mind that, um, it becomes inspirational for the rest of us, right? They've got something compelling uh, that can change and reset the bar of possibility for a community. So on a project like this, the, the impact, the long-term impact of public art is the experience itself uh, becomes a reference point for the students and the collaborators that participated, but then its permanence or semi-permanence 
is a, an ongoing reminder of what's possible when communities come together around a shared vision and, and bring that vision to life. Um, it's exciting to hear uh, Nancy described the impact of the DC Black Lives Matter mural. In New York, we had the pleasure, one of the other projects we were involved with this summer was the Black Lives Matter mural at Foley Square, uh, which is the center of the, the legal system in Manhattan. All the courthouses are right there. And specifically, we were asked to be part of that to facilitate students and volunteers in the process. Fast Company called that particular collaboration, um, the future of urbanism because of the way public officials, architects, engineers, designers, artists, volunteers, regular people came together to develop this, this masterpiece work of art. Um, our letter, our primary assignment was right in front of the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse, right? The man who argued the case that desegregated public schools. Um, our students, our public school students, painted the A in the word black in front of the name plate on the courthouse, right? That becomes a connection to history, but also a statement about the future that we're creating together, right? It, we're part of this ongoing narrative um, and projects like this allow students to locate themselves, you know, in that continuum um, and to make a statement about the world that they're creating that's different than the one they've inherited from the rest of us. Um, and that's why we get involved again in this particular image, you know, because of social distancing, we kept the numbers smaller this summer than we normally would. Um, but it's exciting to see the spaces change and the messages last. Beautiful, thanks, Jeremy. Um, Ronnie, uh, since you are an instructor, I know you work in all sorts of arts with your student. Why don't you talk a little bit about this picture here? Yes, um, so this particular photograph is um, from our 2020 Black History program, uh, which followed the national theme of African Americans and the right to vote. Um, we found that this national theme was so on time um, even though I think they're laid out possibly 10 years in advance. Um, but it was really on time because, um, you know, of the population of young people who are approaching voting age and needing to learn um, really kind of how they can impact um, our system and impact the world um, by using their right to vote. Um, so we delve into history in this um, particular project, but um, essentially, we treat the voting machine as a time machine, um, a little hokey, um, but what, what a reluctant young voter found um, when he went through history is kind of how pivotal um, the right to vote had been in our history. Um, also, kind of the tough part um, about dealing with history in a time when um, we're kind of uh, in a continuing hotbed of um, issues is that um, it's easier to say this is history and things are different now. And that was really what the students had a hard time with. And I challenged them, we challenged them because I actually worked with um, a beautiful panel of educators. Um, there were about uh, 12 of us um, who took different roles in um, making sure we got to the finish line with this project. but. Um, the kids had to write, they had to create, and they had to channel those questions um, at least in a way that would um, fit the narrative, but also force the audience to ask questions, right? And to, and to grapple um, because in no way, shape or form are we saying that voting is a fix all because it's not, it's kind of your beginning primer into participation in the political process. And so you have to have skin in the game. And that's really what our message was. Um, the kids created, um, so every aspect, like you said, of art um, is employed in our Black History program. Um, our costumes um, were by a student, um, hair, makeup, we did photography, we did archival, learning how to dive into the archive, right? Um, and so there was a great deal of uh, media, um, dance, um, 
just all of the arts channeled to figure out now that we're here, how do we use our voice um, and how do we kind of get where we need to be? Um, even though, you know, things are seem to be quite bleak in certain ways. There's a lot of hope in it still because you do have your right that was um, fought and earned for you. Um, so yes, this young man is now, you know, looking forward to an acting career. Um, he did an amazing job. Um, we have original songs that were created that will um, hopefully, once we get out of quarantine, we'll make music videos for and continue to encourage our young people with the art we made. Great, thank you. And I see uh, mm -hmm. Superintendent Baron Davis giving you all a shout out um, from Richland too on the chat there. Um, Aisha, speaking of hope, uh, let's show the image that you've created and talk a little bit about the inspiration. Yes, yeah, so this painting, as you see, is of George Floyd and his family and his daughter. I created this after watching a news clip of them actually with Gigi and she was saying, my daddy changed the world. And when I saw that, it brought me to tears and it just made me ponder for many, many days. Why did I feel that way? And it just made me realize that this is a bittersweet moment in time. Her father sparked change with a sacrifice that didn't need to be made, but was made in his death. And I just wanted to create something that was based off of it. And not just as far as the painting itself, I just knew that this could be a piece that ha held a lot of meaning to it. So during the same time that I had created this piece, South Carolina was doing the Million Man March, where residents would come and walk the streets all the way down to the Capitol building. And when we went there, we, I spoke with a lot of the leaders of that march and they wanted me to actually be on the truck that led the march all the way down, just showcasing the fact that this piece is why we're here. We're here to showcase the fact that there are injustices and a lot of people, innocent people are being hurt by these things in many ways, whether it's small or large. So. We just have to remember why we're here. We're just trying to make it a fair ground for all because we all have issues in our communities, but at least have that platform to where all of us can just have that foundation and not tear it down for others. So when I created this, it just really sparked a lot of hope in a lot of people and it just empowered a lot. I also had people sign the back of the painting. I had the sheriff's department, I had Everybody that was out there, they all signed the back and it ended up being sent off to, it ended up also being sent off to Gigi's family. So as soon as it was over, I gave it to her and I just had that as a symbol of hope because she's still a little girl. And even though she's in the midst of all of this, I really wanted that to happen. And literally a month later after all this had happened, the Russian Library had reached out to me to do a mural for the side of their building featuring a little girl leaping. Because honestly, within the situation, we have to show our youth that it might be tough to speak out and it might be very difficult for you to actually do this, but it's a risk worth taking because the reward is great for all. You get to be in a situation where we all can just live in harmony and peace and just have that fair ground. So, Doing that, it just sparked many, many more murals. I've done many murals in KC showcasing little innocent children just in a positive light so people can see that we're all the same. We all have, we're all human. And it just it's allowed me to just open that door, just showcasing what we've been saying over and over again through generations, but through the voice of art in ways that it could touch people that you, your voice can't. So it definitely has been an honor to even be a part of something this big. Wow, thank you for that story um, and inspiration. As someone said in the chat, it's so powerful. Um, appreciate you all sharing um, some visual imagery to start. I want to dive in a little bit to talk about um, students in schools. A couple of weeks ago, Edward had an article about how students are demanding curriculum and experience in schools around racial and social justice, right? Uh, so students are protesting, they're speaking, um, they're creating art and music, 
So talk a little bit about how schools can address the student demand for relevant real-time applied learning experiences using the arts. Um, where is the opportunity for schools to weave students' demand for social and racial justice um, into the, the school experience, the learning experience? And anyone can take that. Um, if I may take a first crack at it, I think it can happen on two levels, right? First of all, on a very fundamental level, uh, we see over and over again that when budgets get cut and priorities are, are changed, the first thing that's usually sacrificed are the music and art programs. Um, in low-income communities, uh, that often means that they go without, right? In a, in a better resource neighborhood, the parents have a fundraiser, they bring the music teacher back or the dance teacher back. That's not always possible. Um, and so reprioritizing uh, our system so that that becomes a non-negotiable, right? That says, no, the, the kids that most require the imagination to see beyond current circumstances uh, that is awakened by artistic experiences, we're not taking those from those kids, right? So the movement to bring art back um, in a more equitable way across economic lines, across geographic lines and school district lines, uh, I think is one way that we can very proactively make the system more just and more equitable. In addition to that, that becomes one of the platforms for students to process their everyday reality, right? So often what we learn in a textbook doesn't match the experience of our everyday lives. And for students in particular, um, the, the, uh, the need to reconcile those two dichotomies, right? The, the creative experiences allow for them to process those differences. It also allows them to ask the questions, why is their experience not reflected in the curriculum that they're, they're learning in the other core classes? And so there's more freedom um, to ask those hard questions in a way that provokes conversations, that provokes action, that provokes change. Um, and so those are some of the reasons I think why, edu why artistic education in particular is at the vanguard of, of equity and justice in our public schools. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, others want to share thoughts? I totally agree with that. I don't know if civics is still being taught um, as a class in schools. I mean, it definitely should, and, and certainly civics and art can go hand in can go hand in hand. Um, you know, this is becoming an increasingly visual society, so it's um, you know, in a unique way to bring in those introduce those subjects in a way that also um, can get uh, young people engaged, but. There are a couple of things going on um, in the art world right now that I'm not sure if a lot of um, educators are aware. I mean, first of all, um, this is probably never, this, this is probably, a, this is, I don't think there's ever been a, a better time to be an artist. The artists that we work with are quite busy. I mean, right now art is being recognized as a vital marketing component. Um, murals are being recognized as critical branding opportunities. And of course, um, public art is increasingly, increasingly being used to um, help to promote social issues. But people are, these are launching pads for young people that have real meaningful careers. You know, usually growing up, um, young people are discouraged from, you know, the creative arts or creative um, uh, paths of opportunities because they're not seen as viable paths of opportunity. Um, we have artists who have who started off as taggers on walls, who have gone on to design clothing, who have gone on to design cars, work for car manufacturers. I think that there needs to be um, some sort of curriculum that really talks about the business side of art um, and really explore it as a viable, um, a viable um, career option for, for young people. Um, I think this generation, more than any generation, is really in touch with doing things that they're passionate about and, and doing things that matter uh, in their lives. And if you have um, the, um, 
if you have the drive and, and the talent and the, the passion to, to be an artist, and there's a way that you can do that and, and make a solid living, I think people, people need to be aware of, of, of those options. And I think there needs to be a lot more education about that um, so that people realize that you know, this is something they can really do and it can make sense. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat, and I think Ronnie, this might um, relate to you, and then I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go to Aisha with a question. Uh, the person is asking, would you recommend that art be a standalone time in the day or integrated into other disciplines with an art specialist? So I'm asking you that in, in parallel with this question about how do we bring more of the arts into schools? Um, well, my mother was a painter, so art was just a part of life. You know, um, and I and I approach my own home in that way. Um, that art is a part of your express your expression. It's an extension, right, of an idea. And sometimes it's a way to arrive in, at an idea. Um, so, though I teach film, I also teach journalism. Um, well, photojournalism um, and broadcast. So, you know, news has gotten quite creative. Um, so it's actually quite cinematic now. Um, and so those things are a part of my job, but even as an English teacher, I made sure that there was an art component in whatever we did. I, I will not ever discredit the fact that they need to go somewhere that is just about art during the day. There needs to be a space where you're learning form, um, technique and all those things. Um, I'll be honest, you know, in addition to whatever course load there is, Black History Program is not a separate class. I mean, you know, we really figure out a way to hedge it into um, our life for four or four or five months. Um, and so it's extra work for everybody. Um, and it's because we feel that, that it's important. Um, so I think they need to go somewhere during the day to a beautiful room with paint and materials and, and all those types of things. And I also think that art needs to be integrated um, in, in all of our classes, because what it allows for, there might be a student who um, can express themselves eloquently in prose, um, and then there might be other students where they don't have the words, but they have the color, you know? Um, they don't have um, the words, but they have it in their body. They understand movement. Um, and um, in terms of social justice curriculums, I will say, you know, it's dangerous as a teacher to even talk about these things in schools. Um, and, you know, that might not be comfortable for people to hear, but, you know, part of our orientations, a lot of that is making sure that you don't, you know, cross, um, cross lines in terms of your political opinion. So there's this point that you have to really be a tightrope tight rope walker and plan, plan, plan exactly how you're going to address bringing the question and allowing students to arrive at their ideas. Um, I would say, you know, in addition to that, um, the curriculums are bountiful out there. Um, there's something I just wanna shout out this person for the work that he does for educators. Jason Reynolds is a YA author and um, he just released this beautiful visual poem called um, For Everyone. And it helped, it helped me to kind of crawl into, right, us talking about what's going on in the world. So I would say that, um, yay, I, I'm sorry. Um, as a teacher right now, I'm so used to looking at the chat that instantly my eyes are like, somebody's participating. Um, but yeah, so it's dangerous for teachers. Um, I don't know, would you all agree? Um, I found that when I taught in a non-traditional environment, um, that it was a little bit easier kind of to navigate that. Um, but it's necessary because students, I'm trying to think of how to frame this. Um, they're a whole person. And they don't come to school without having seen the news, you know? They know what's going on. And oftentimes we have to reroute and help them to understand what reliable sources are, right? To make sure that they're not just picking up on memes or, you know, headlines that aren't true. 
um, but really how to dig and research. So all of those things need to be in integrated, um, in my opinion. So I hope I answered that. That question kind of um, took me in a different direction, but the children are there, the students, I always, I have a picture um, that I always show them of young people going to jail during the civil rights movement. And they're always astonished that they're, that people sent their children to the front lines um, during the civil rights movement um, because they had to work and feed their family. But it was important enough um, that, that, that they were visible um, on the front lines of that movement. It's difficult now because even with my own children, I don't want them in harm's way and I don't want them to have a record. You know, so um, sometimes I, you know, I, I go back to some of those manuals that our great thinkers um, put out for us, those words of James Baldwin, um, to try to encourage me on what is our new approach to really getting at the root of our issues. Um, yeah, so. Great, well, thank you for speaking to some of the complexities of bringing social and racial justice into schools. Um, I do wanna to turn to Aisha because in many ways, art changed your life. You, you, know, you were living in some of the tough realities that a lot of students are living in. And so art really brought you out in many ways of yourself and your circumstance kind of allowed you to express yourself. Um, I I'd love to hear from, from your perspective around how schools can be more responsive and what works for you? I love this question so much because I wouldn't be the artist I am today if it wasn't for this question. As a child, art was self-therapy for me, so I was doing it regardless because of things that were going on in my home or at school. That was just a way for me to escape. I was at the point to where I was drawing on my test. I wouldn't do any work. Um, and my teachers caught on to that. One teacher in particular, she was at Dent Middle School for Richland too. As I'm a Richland II alumnus, I've been to a bunch of schools in Richland too. And she took us to a gallery, uh, just as a, just a random museum trip. And she just was like, uh, take pictures and write the numbers down of how many art pieces you like for each room. And when we get back, we're gonna do some equations based off of what you've seen and i did amazing and at the end of class she actually pulled me aside and said you're very smart you're smarter than the smartest kids in class it's just the way you need to be taught is different and it just brought back that question that i had been given a long time ago from an old man that i had met at school and he said you know one thing he's learned throughout his career was children are like a zoo. You have dolphins, you have um, elephants and everything, but if you tell a monkey to climb the tree, how could the fish climb the tree? He excels at swimming, not climbing. And with that, like throughout all of my years, my teachers just caught on to the fact that I am a creator. So for me to thrive in their, their ways, they would have to incorporate art. So doing projects, I got excited for that. I'll learn how to do an equation if that means I get to draw on the board to create. It's just, I started to excel once teachers started to catch on. And since I stayed, I was lucky enough to stay in Richland too. So those same teachers were able to bring it on to the next teachers and just continue to thrive as an artist. And that's mainly why I was able to stay in my career path because instead of having a lot of people say, no, you need to stop. This is how you need to learn. And me never being able to catch on, having people reach out to me and say, hey, you really can do this. It's just you would have to learn a different way. Actually having people take the time out to learn their students and realize we all learn differently. And creativity sparks the minds in ways to make learning fun. I feel like it's, it's very important. And I'm just grateful that I had that because me being a student, you see, where I am now as an artist, it's because I had that backing and those that believed in me to say, hey, you can do this. You just have to put forth the effort differently than other students. And it doesn't matter because you still are getting it done. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I love, love your story. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Jeremy, uh, 
one thing that struck me when we spoke uh, as you talked about um, you know we have this notion of food deserts um, and all sorts of kind of uh, ways in which communities of color don't have access to health care and all sorts of um, opportunities but one thing that you said on the call is that communities of color are rich in the arts and um, so why don't you talk a little bit about how kind of how you look at communities of color and the richness of the arts and how to make that come to life, particularly as schools and communities can work together. Yeah, um, so one, one of the framing, you know, elements for us in any of our school partnerships is we're not going into a school to, uh, you know, save the school or like change it from the outside our posture is always one of treasure hunting, right? We begin with a belief that every person in that building is a masterpiece life. Um, and not only are they masterpieces, but within the community that surrounds the school, they're teeming with natural resources. Our creative director likes to say that in any of our communities, if you throw a rock, you're gonna hit an artist, right? You're gonna find a dancer, a visual artist, a painter, um, a, a, an actor, a filmmaker, a photographer. And so the creative capacity to imagine a different reality for, for the students um, already exists. And so part of what we do is help to connect those dots, right? To be the bridge uh, between that local indigenous resource that's already so abundant um, and the schools, which because of systemic inequities find themselves without music and art programs, right? It, it doesn't make sense that in the very same neighborhoods um, that birthed hip hop, for example, in New York City, you have, as recently as five years ago, 419 schools serving a quarter of a million students without a single music or art teacher in the building. Right, it doesn't make any sense in the same geographic neighborhoods where hip hop was born, which by the way, includes all of the art forms, right? Music, dance, performance, visual arts. It all was birthed from within the neighborhood. And so for us, yeah, the system is, is imbalanced and there are these dysfunctions, but the neighborhood has, an, uh, has a built in remedy. And so how do we activate that? Um, and that's part of the, the fun uh, for somebody like me, who's frankly not an artist in the way that some of my colleague panelists are, right? I personally don't have the skill set to produce the things that Thrive Collective has a reputation for producing. But my art is the people, bringing the people together, making those connections happen, developing that shared vision, and recognizing that, you know, we didn't really have to do a whole lot other than create an environment for the flourishing of, of uh, the human creativity that already exists in the neighborhood. Yes, yes, the vibrancy that's already there. I love that. Um, Nancy, I'd love to, I'm trying to kind of look at the QA here and there's, there's a question here about um, social justice work can't happen without healing. There are artists and art therapists doing some amazing social justice work too. Mm -hmm. What I'd love to understand is, you know, in leading this effort to, um, you know, make this Black Lives Matter mural happen in Washington, D.C., and then seeing this kind of take off across the world, I mean, there's, a, there's an aspect of healing and unity in that, right? And so I'm curious about kind of what you've observed um, from that perspective um, after the, you know, after you uh, launched the mural there. Yeah, so creating the mural was, significant enough and then having the mayor change that the name of that street was hugely significant but what i didn't realize what was what was even more significant is how much the community actually needed that space um you know we sort of looked at it as a statement but black lives matter plaza became a living breathing thing um every every time if every time i go there there's something going on that's amazing either people are one time i went there and and all of these brass wind instruments had just combined they had some of them had like black lives matter painted on the side of their wood their wood their um their 
horn instruments and they were just playing music and people were just coming together and there was so much like just in the spirit of love you know they do midnight yoga the other after chad chadwick um bozeman passed they had a viewing of um, black panther i mean there is so much you know I, I keep saying that it's like that expression from that movie field of dreams build it and they will come and what i didn't realize is i don't think anyone realized in that moment is that people really needed that space for healing um and if you're talking about um you know helping to guide uh children along um discussions of of, of civics discussion or social discourse um to me since so many cities have these places these spaces i would say start you know take a field trip to some of to these locations where you have um these murals in the street um because i would imagine what's going on in dc is probably going on in other cities and just let that sort of be a, a starting point to have that conversation you know what do you see why do you think people are here um even just talking to uh i mean you can get a history lesson just by looking at the art that people have sort of posted along the um, the plywood along there and the fence in that area. There's just there's it's it's such an emotional experience. And there's to me there's no way you can bring young people into that experience without them being changed, um, without them starting to think about um, how they can be a part of this. What are they doing to make the world a better place? Um, and to just really get them to want to be engaged. Uh, even if it's even if it's adding to some of the artwork that's that's there on the walls, but it is such a powerful place, um, and I just I had no idea it was going to be that. I mean, certainly we hope that that it remains, but during this time period, there's a lot of frustration and anger, um, and there's really no healthy way. There are very few healthy ways to express that, um, and I feel like these places have been they become healing places for people. Um, and I, I just don't think that people realize how much, how much they were needed. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Ronnie, I want to go back to this notion of, you said it's, it's dangerous. It can be dangerous, right? To, um, talk about these subjects, interweave them into learning experiences and curriculum. There's a panelist, uh, who's, I mean, sorry, there's a, um, audience member who said it can be dangerous here in Oregon too. So talk a little bit about, you know, some of the complexities of, of balance, balance kind of, you know, you're in South Carolina navigating some of this um, and also how you're kind of uh, rethinking curriculum as someone put in the question um, as you kind of have students that are coming in and wanting different experiences. So how are you thinking about really rethinking how you're presenting, learning, and weaving in the arts in the curriculum, in the core curriculum. All right, fantastic. Um, well, you know, when I moved back to South Carolina, um, I actually found that suddenly Columbia was in the in national news a great deal. Um, it wasn't because I was here. Columbia actually has throughout history been um, a very central place for um, the drive toward social equity. Um, so we had this major flood, they called it a thousand year flood. Um, there was a young woman, um, and right this moment, her name just left me, who climbed up the flagpole and removed the Confederate flag. Um, so th there's a lot here. Um, a lot of, so I would say it's dangerous. <laughs> Um, in that, depending on your leadership, um, there can be moments where even amongst your colleagues, they don't even accept hi historical, documented historical events. Um, and so a couple years back, um, I'll give a short anecdote about danger. Um, we did a Black history program and we follow the national theme. Um, and I will admit here, we do that to protect ourselves. Thank you, Bree Newsom. Yes, um, Bree Newsom was the young woman um, who, who did that most beautiful act. Um, but a couple years back, uh, the national theme was African Americans in time of war. And um, along with this beautiful panel of teachers that we worked with, we just did not want to deal with this idea. We did not want to promote war uh, in that space. We wanted to look at the ways in which 
African Americans had endured and overcome war in different ways. Okay, so there are there are emotional wars, right, that have been fought. We have wars uh, to just be, you know, considered um, a full human, um, not inferior. Um, all these types of things, right? So we did. Um, we made this. Uh, it's like a 101 history um, parallel between Trayvon Martin and um, and um, Emmett Till. Essentially, the basis were that. You have a young person killed by a vigilante, which then sparks a movement, right? So this is basic cause and effect. Um, the, the outcry behind that particular scene was tremendous. There were teachers at our school who signed petitions against us. They said that we were divisive and hateful. Um, and, um, you know, there were people who said, you know, that they were for the first time uncomfortable in their own skin. And, you know, I stood on what we said because it was just history. Our principal did back us. It was all historical facts, but it was an air in the space that you couldn't shake, you know, because um, the uncomfortability of looking at that at, at this brave woman, Mamie, because we were really talking about Mamie's decision to put her son on the cover of Jet Magazine as a way to ignite the movement. Um, so it, it was tough. I mean, I, you know, after working for five months, basically an extra job to make sure the play came together, myself and the panel of teachers, we were really distraught because we felt that our work had kind of just been slapped into this um, stereotype of of, um, of of black folk whining, okay, about about what they had been through. Um, so that was a tough thing. But we came back the next year and we got better at. Uh, we understand that art allows you to digest tough things, right? And so we understood that okay, now is the time we got to amp up that narrative. We got to amp up. Um, kind of the, the honey on the teaspoon, um, because we're still going to tell truth. And um, ironically, that next year, um, teachers, even teachers who had just, you know, expressed some distress the year before, they, it's almost like the exposure to that toughness allowed them to start being open to exploring history um, and exploring our, all of our role in history. Um, and so the next year was better. Um, about 70% of our staff did not know about Tulsa, did not know about Black Wall Street. And so you understand that it's important for us to give this history in the context of art um, so that when you see what's going on today, you understand it's not in a vacuum, right? There's this continuum, right, um, of things. I want to kind of come off of the opposition and, and a little bit just touch on healing because that is a mainstay. I believe that healing is a part of social justice, um, that it, we cannot do the other things without it. Um, and people who do social justice work um, are often uh, deeply distraught and unhealthy. Um, teachers are often unhealthy, right? Because of the pressure um, of walking into a room and pretending that you don't have, that you didn't watch the news, okay? so. Um, yeah, it's dangerous, and uh, I don't know if it's just South Carolina. We have our first African American superintendent in history, um, and I'm very thankful to be a part of that history. Um, um, so hopefully, things are changing, um, and will continue to change. So great, thank you, Ronnie. I know we're getting um, close to the end here, but I would love to do a quick round robin, a couple sentences from each of you, just to some parting thoughts um, for the audience whatever you want to share. Um, and Jeremy, I will flag that there was a question in here about funding opportunities for art pro arts programs. So maybe you can say a, a couple sentences about that if you would like. So let's start with Jeremy. Um, I guess uh, responding to the funding question, um, like a lot of artists, I think we have an opportunity to create some new funding models. And one of the ways that we do that is providing a service 
um, that the schools need and are demanding, um, that the community is responding to. I mean, we see it all the time. It was referenced earlier uh, that art, visual arts, particularly in a digital space, are becoming more and more imperative as people are using, uh, you know, online platforms, even like this one. Um, and so figuring out how to adapt what we do um, so that it's a sustainable funding source, I think is important. The other thing I would say about that is so many of the existing, uh, you know, traditional philanthropic structures um, pit us as competitors and not collaborators. So for the artist community to reframe as many opportunities as we can, as new opportunities to collaborate um, cross discipline, you know, with the media personalities and the music personalities, as well as the visual artists, I think any of those uh, create more sustainable funding models for us to, to build with. Great, thank you so much. Nancy, any parting thoughts for the audience? Yeah, you know, I was listening to Ronnie and um, you know, what you express is, is it's an experience that oppressed people um, have deal with so much in terms of sharing, um, just sharing basic history and how people can um, react to that. And I, you know, we live in a time of fake news and, you know, um, or people just um, believing this, the particular um, network channels or social media channels that they see. Um, and facts are getting lost. And it, it now is, if they're, if they're never, I mean, there's always, it's always important. Critical thinking is always important. And I think that there has got to be an emphasis on encouraging young people to think for themselves and explore for themselves and research for themselves. And I think art provides a perfect tie-in, again, to have those conversations. Um, you know, when you talk about people, there are people who are still saying that the Holocaust didn't happen. Um, so you know that they're, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hard for them to accept uh, things like Tulsa and other cities. But I mean, you got to have these conversations, but I just feel like art can play such a critical role in that. And, um, you know, it, again, art is provocative. It makes you think about things. It makes you, um, it, it makes you, it makes you start to um, have your own sense of your own set of ideas and, and your own, um, your own mores, and we really have to get back to that. Just, I mean, we can see what's happening w without it. And so hopefully all those educators out there will sort of, will definitely realize, you know, it can't always be just about, you know, teaching to a test or, you know, focusing on some standard curriculum. We need leaders, we need thought innovators. You cannot have a successful society without that. And art is so at the core of that. It, it gets cast aside, I think, for other reasons. But um, it is so central to all of that. Great, thank you. Um, and Ronnie, since you shared your thoughts, I'm gonna end with Aisha, if that's uh, all right with you, um, kind of closing us out. So Aisha, some final thoughts before you wrap up. Well, for me, my final thoughts would be that just having conversations like this, being able to just continue to talk about it, I feel like that is the most important thing about all of this, because I find this movement is like a seed. You can bury it all you want. Uh, we might not even see it all the time, but at the end of the day, it'll continue to grow no matter how far down in the soil it is of people wanting to get rid of it. So as me as an artist and many of the panelists and those that are all around the world, I feel that this movement will continue to grow and be strong and show everyone that this is very important. It's positive. It's nothing against anyone else. And it's very, very, important that we do what we're doing. And I just thank you for this opportunity to come and speak. I have enjoyed speaking with all the other panelists. Y'all have brought so much to me as a young person to bring out to all those that I mentor. And I just want to continue to grow and just continue to change how things are seen here. Thank you. Well, keep inspiring us with your, what you're doing. And to everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time today. I uh, really appreciate you being here uh, and for you sharing and being very candid uh, around where there are opportunities and also where there's challenges. And as we think about um, the role of art in education, 
Uh, for folks that are in the audience, uh, we have more town halls coming. Uh, so just stay tuned, uh, keep an eye on uh, Digital Promise. Uh, check out our YouTube channel for the recording. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on a future town hall. Thank you very much.